she took hold of one part with her mouth and placed one part on her private parts. Edward Reeb's Buddhist Books Podcast, episode 94, Tibitaka, part 33, in which I will be reciting Nisagiya 4 and 5. If this is your first time seeing me, go ahead and click here. That will take you to the Tibitaka playlist. You can start with episode 1 of the Tibitaka. So what are we reading and why? Um, We're reading the very earliest texts of Buddhism, the first basket of the three baskets of early Buddhism um, and Theravada, which are canonical within Mahayana and Vajrayana as well. Uh, They're not as emphasized. For people familiar with Mahayana, Vajrayana, Zen, these are the instructions to the monks which are said to have become the arhats. The, uh, the monks who attained nirvana before the idea of um, bodhisattva, or bodhisattvas, becoming a bodhisattva and taking the oath to reincarnate over and over until everybody is enlightened. Um, so from that, from, you know, from the usual kind of mainstream 99, I'd say, percent of Buddhists uh, refer to this period as, I mean, consciously or unconsciously, sort of a selfish time, that they were uh, in it for their own enlightenment, as opposed to post-Mahayana or Mahayana and forward, where the emphasis is on compassion, um, attaining enlightenment only so that you can become a bodhisattva and help everyone else attain enlightenment. This is entirely focused on just attaining enlightenment. Now, personally, I think that that's a limited way to experience these uh, early texts, kind of from that vantage point of, okay, well, let's see how they were doing it in the beginning. From another perspective, you could also say that if you're interested in Lord Buddha and his teachings, this is where they are. All that other stuff, Mahayana forward, was developed by the descendants of the descendants of the descendants of the descendants, you know, um, and influenced by other things like Christianity and, and, uh, you know, various philosophies that became popular centuries after Lord Buddha walked the earth. So however you want to experience it is up to you. If you're still watching, then I assume that you are interested um, on some level. Uh, But I have determined that I want to read every word of these texts, and the first basket is the rules, which means that I've committed to spending, who knows, a year, maybe longer, reading rules, rules for monks. Um, Some of it's interesting, some of it's horrifying, some of it's very, very boring and dull. And so just so you know uh, what we're getting into or what you're getting into or what you've already gotten into, if if you indeed have been following along this podcast for all 33 episodes of TV Taka or perhaps all 94 episodes of uh, of this podcast or this playlist or however. Um, So, yeah, anyhow, just uh, those are just some some thoughts at the top. Uh, before we dive in, the uh, uh, the reason perhaps that I'm mentioning this is the last uh, the last couple of episodes were pretty dull. Um, there's I, I, you've heard me mention probably before that I absolutely love Dogen's Shobogenzo. Yes, that is the version here. That's that was volume one. Here's volume two, volume three. 
in volume four. Those are the translations that I read uh, twice and that really kind of got me started on the yoga path, actually, because I thought that that would be a good way to uh, to start. And um, well, anyway, I won't go over all that again. You've heard me talk about that before if, if you've heard a lot of the previous episodes. But um, there are two lectures where Dogen goes on and on and on about robes, the importance of robes. And um, yeah, I can see from, uh, you know, there's a person could take kind of a mystical perspective. But I mean, a, a person who's, pro who's served in an army, you know, probably can relate this to the uniform or, or a person who, um, you know, takes their work very seriously. Perhaps they, they take their, their suit very seriously. Um, or a person who's like an indie rocker might take their ripped jeans and, uh, you know, not caring what shirt they wear very seriously, actually. They wouldn't want to be seen uh, wearing the wrong uniform. So our special guest today is a, uh, a naughty monk, I've decided. The, the story here is that at one point... I decided to start making little Buddha statues, or at least little statues of, of people meditating, bald people meditating, so I guess that implies monkhood. Um, he, uh, this one in particular, he was sitting upright. He was sitting like this, and um, the, the sculpey was more of like this color, and uh, then I guess I left it in the oven for too long, and... Um, he came to look like this and uh, he seems to be falling asleep or deep in thought. He seems to be perhaps a little bit sad um, and he is naked. So for our purposes here, we could say that he either uh, went on a trip without all three of his robes and then he had to forfeit his robes or he kept four robes for longer than 10 days. Or he kept more than four robes for any length of time and uh, had to forfeit them. So now he's naked. So uh, we can hope that the order or the Sangha decides that it's appropriate to return his robes to him so that he can continue upon the path. He, he seems remorseful. Um, this was my first attempt, and then after I made this one, I started using little bits of paper clip inside. I had like a paper clip spine, and I was able to make monks that were seated perfectly upright and all of this sort of thing. But then when it came time for me to pack all my things and uh, move to India from California, this was the only one that I brought because I don't know. I feel like it tells a story and um, it, has, it has a certain character to it. Him, he has a certain character to him. So that's all I've got for you today. Just thought I'd mix it up a bit. It's fun to have a special guest um, for these readings. It's fun for me anyway. All right. How is everyone? Everyone good? All right. I'll go ahead and begin the reading. Forfeiture. Nisagia for. At one time, the Enlightened One, the Lord, was staying at Savati in the Jetta Grove in Anathapindika's monastery. Now, at that time, some of you know what's coming, who are on uh, YouTube, those of you listening to the audio only, I apologize, I haven't forgotten about you. How do you like the noise pollution today? I personally love it. Um, I mentioned Chukung the other day when I was young, just in, in brief, because people have heard this story before. My dad would chant Om, and then he'd get really upset if there was some noise outside because he couldn't meditate in silence properly the way he liked it. And so my three-year-old brain processed this and decided that my word instead of Om would be Chukung, and I would meditate along with the sound of the lawnmower next door or the weed whackers, or the garbage truck, or whatever it is. Um, so then anytime there was a loud noise, I would sit down and sit upright and say, Chukung! 
And uh, I wasn't quite at the age where I was able to articulate what I was doing or what was going on in my head. So many years later, my mom told me that um, Chikung was my word for the, uh, the air conditioner and also the vacuum cleaner and also the lawnmower. And I explained, um, no, that it wasn't the word for that. That was, that was my mantra to, uh, to meditate in the midst of the noise. And so when there's noise outside and I say Chikung, that's what I'm referring to. All right, back to the reading, shall we? Um, now at that time, the former wife of the venerable Udayan. Oh, I had taken him to be a virgin based on his reaction when a woman actually said yes to him. And he said, you're smelly and ran out. All right, so he had a former wife. Hmm, all right. We're learning a little bit more about Udayan today. The former wife of the venerable Udayan had gone forth among the nuns. Oh, Udayan's former wife is a nun in Buddha's order. What a trip. Let's, uh, let's appoint this as Udayan's former wife, who's a nun. Perhaps we can call them the Jacks, Jackass and Jackrabbit. That's a silly joke. Okay, she frequently came to the venerable Udayan, and the venerable Udayan frequently went to this nun. Now, at that time, the venerable Udayan used to participate in a meal with this nun. Then the venerable Udayan, dressed in the morning, taking his bowl and robe, approached this nun, and having approached and disclosed his private parts in front of this nun, he sat down on a seat, and further, the nun, having disclosed her private parts in front of the venerable Udayan, sat down on a seat. Then the venerable Udayan, impassioned, looked at and thought about this nun's private parts and emitted semen. Then the venerable Udayan said to this nun, quote, Go, sister, fetch water. I will wash the inner robe. End quote. Quote, Give it to me, master. I will wash it myself. End quote. To me was in parentheses. This is more interesting than the last one, I have to say. And she took hold of one part with her mouth and placed one part on her private parts. Because of this, she conceived a child. The nuns spoke thus, quote, This nun is one who does not lead the Brahma life because she is pregnant, end quote, because was in parentheses open parentheses, she saying, closed parentheses, quote, Ladies, I am not one who does not lead the Brahma life, end quote, and uh, told this matter to the nuns. The nuns looked down upon, criticized, spread it about, saying, quote, How can Master Udayan get a soiled robe washed by a nun, end quote. Then these nuns told this matter to the monks. Those who were modest monks looked down upon, criticized, spread it about, saying, quote, How can the venerable Udayan get a soiled robe washed by a nun? Then these monks told this matter to the Lord. He said, quote, Is it true, as is said, that you, Udayan, got a soiled robe washed by a nun? End quote. It is true, Lord, he said. Was she a relation of yours, Udayan, 
or not a relation. End quote. Quote, she was not a relation, Lord. End quote, he said. Quote, foolish man. One who is not a relation does not know what is suitable or what is unsuitable or what is pleasant or what is unpleasant for a woman who is not a relation. Thus you, foolish man, will get a soiled robe washed by a nun who is not a relation. It is not, foolish man, for pleasing those who are not yet pleased, yet in parentheses, three dots. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. Whatever monk should get a soiled robe washed or dyed or beaten by a nun who is not a relation, there is an offense of expiation regarding forfeiture. Whatever means, he who, on account of his relations, on account of his social standing, on account of his name, on account of his clan, on account of his morals, on account of his dwelling, on account of his field of activity, in parentheses, an elder or a novice or one of middle standing, this is called whatever. Monk means he is a monk because he is a beggar for alms, a monk because he submits to wandering for alms, a monk because he is one who wears the patchwork cloth, a monk by the designation, parentheses of others, and parentheses, a monk on account of his knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, on account of his acknowledgement, a monk is called, quote, come monk, and parentheses. A monk is endowed with going to the three refugees. A monk is auspicious. A monk is the essential. A monk is a learner. A monk is an adept. A monk means one who is endowed with harmony for the order. The, with the resolution at which the motion is put three times and then followed by the decision with actions, parentheses, in accordance with Dhamma and the discipline, and parentheses, with steadfastness, with attributes of a man perfected. Whatever monk is endowed with harmony for the order, with the resolution at which the motion is put three times, and then followed by the decision with actions, parentheses, in accordance with Dhamma and the discipline, I think that's implied, right? Maybe that's what they're saying. Okay, end parentheses. With steadfastness, okay, actions, like not just any old action, like actions that are, anyway. With steadfastness and the attributes of a man perfected, this one is a monk as understood in this meaning. Open parentheses, a nun, closed parentheses, who is not a relation means. One who is not related on the mother's side or on the father's side back through seven generations. None means one ordained by both orders. A soiled robe means dressed in it once, put on once. Wash means he gives an order. There is an offense of wrongdoing. If washed, it is to be forfeited. Die means, D-Y-E that is, he gives an order. There is an offense of wrongdoing. If died, it is to be forfeited. Beat means, he gives an order. There is an offense of wrongdoing. If once having given it a blow with the palm of the hand, of the hand being in parentheses, or a blow with a club, it is to be forfeited. It should be forfeited to the order, or to a group, or to an individual, and thus, monks, should it be forfeited. Quote, within quotes, Honored sirs, this soiled robe which I had washed by a nun who is not a relation is to be forfeited. I forfeit it to the order. End quote, within quotes, three dots. Quote, within quotes, three dots. The order should give back. Three dots. 
somebody's having a disagreement outside. Are you able to hear that? It's a, a might distracting, is it not? Let the venerable ones give back four gods. I will give back this robe to the venerable one. End quote within quotes. End quote. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation, and makes her wash his soiled robe, his being in parentheses, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation, and makes her wash, makes her dye his soiled robe, there is an offense of wrongdoing together with an offense of forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation, and makes her wash, makes her beat his soiled robe, there is an offense of wrongdoing, together with an offense involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation, and makes her wash, makes her dye, makes her beat his soiled robe, there are two offenses of wrongdoing together with an offense involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and makes her dye his soiled robe, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and makes her dye, makes her beat his soiled robe, there is an offense of wrongdoing together with an offense involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and makes her dye, makes her wash his soiled robe, there is an offense of wrongdoing together with an offense involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and makes her die, makes her beat, makes her wash his soiled robe, there are two offenses of wrongdoing together with an offense involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and makes her beat his soiled robe, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and he makes her beat, makes her wash his soiled robe, there is an offense of wrongdoing together with an offense involving forfeiture. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and makes her beat, makes her dye his soiled robe, there is an offense of wrongdoing together with an offense involving forfeiture. It feels a little bit like I've been saying the same sentence over and over for the past few minutes. I think there are some differences. Perhaps in listening to it, I'll be able to note the subtleties and figure out through elaborate quadratic equations what the wrongdoings are when there's three actions and two wrongdoings and one forfeiture. It's not sinking in at the moment. I'm just being honest. All right. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is not a relation and makes her beat, makes her wash, makes her dye his soiled robe, there are two offenses of wrongdoing together with an offense involving forfeiture. If he is in doubt as to whether she is not a relation, three dots. If he thinks that a woman is a relation when she is not a relation, three dots. If he makes her wash another's soiled robe, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he makes her wash a sheet used as a piece of cloth for sitting on, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he makes a woman who has been ordained by one order only, oh right, okay, so a nun has been ordained by two orders, but if she has only been ordained in one order. If he makes a woman who has been ordained in one order only wash it, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that she is not a relation when she is a relation, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he is in doubt as to whether she is a relation, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that she is a relation when she is a relation, there is no offense. Right? There is no offense when a female relation is washing it if a woman assistant who is not a relation is helping. If she washes it, unasked, if he makes her wash an unused one, if he makes her wash another requisite, oh, that, that means a sandal, bowl, shoulder strap, girdle, 
couch, chair, or straw mat, except the robe. If it is washed by a female probationer, by a female novice, if he is mad, if he is the first wrongdoer. Ah, right, okay. So probationers, eh, yeah. Interesting story, though. That's the end of Nisagia 4. Moving along now to Nisagia 5. At one time, the enlightened one, the Lord, was staying at Rajagaha, Rajgir, in the bamboo grove at the squirrel's feeding place. I don't seem to have a squirrel. Moving along. At that time, the, new, the nun Upa Lavana, introducing a new character here, was staying at Sabati. Then the nun Upa Lavana, dressing in the morning and taking her bowl and robe, entered Sabati for alms food. Having wandered about Savati for alms food, returning from her alms gathering after her meal, she approached the blind men's grove for the midday rest. Having plunged into the blind men's grove, she sat down at the foot of a tree for the midday rest. Now at that time, some thieves, having done their deed, Having killed a cow and taken the flesh, entered the blind men's grove. Then the robber chief saw the nun Upalavana. As she was sitting at the foot of the tree for the midday rest, and seeing her, it occurred to him, quote, If my sons and brothers see this nun, they will trouble her. They will trouble her, end quote. And he went by a different way. Then that robber chief, taking the best meats of the cooked meat, tying them up, them up in parentheses, in a leaf packet and hanging it up on a tree near the nun Upalavana, said, quote, whatever recluse or Brahmin sees it, it is given to him. Let him take it. What a kind robber chief. End quote. And having spoken thus, he departed. Then the nun Upalavana, arising from contemplation, heard these words of that robber chief as he was speaking. Then the nun Upalavana, taking that meat, went to the nunnery. Then the nun Upalavana, having prepared that meat at the end of the night, tying it up into a bundle with her upper robe, rising in the air, reappeared in the bamboo grove. Now, at that time, the Lord was visiting the village for alms food, and the venerable Udayin came to be the one left behind as guardian of the dwelling. Then the nun Upalavana approached the venerable Udayan, and having approached, she said to the venerable Udayan, Where, honored sir, is the Lord? He said, Sister, the Lord has entered the village for alms food. Quote, Give this meat to the Lord, honored sir. End quote, she said. Quote, you, sister, have pleased the Lord with this meat. If you were to give me your inner robe, likewise would I become pleased with the inner robe. End quote. Quote, but we women, honored sir, get things with difficulty. This is my last, my fifth robe. My being in parentheses, I shall not give it to you, end quote, she said. Quote, 
It is as if, sister, a man giving an elephant should comparison its girth. Yet even so do you, sister, though giving meat to the Lord, not give me your inner robe. End quote. Then the nun Upalavana, being pressed by the venerable Udayan, giving him her inner robe, went to the nunnery. The nuns, taking the nun Upalavana's bowl and robe, said to Upalavana, quote, Lady, where is your inner robe? The nun Upalavana told this matter to the nuns. The nuns looked down upon, criticized, spread it about, saying, How can the venerable Udayan accept a robe from a nun? Women come by things with difficulty. End quote. And then these nuns told this matter to the monks. Those who were modest monks, three dots, spread it about, saying, quote, How can the venerable Udayan accept a robe from a nun? Then these monks told this matter to the Lord. He said, Is it true, Udayan, that you accepted a robe from a nun? It is true, Lord. Is she a relation of yours, Udayan, or not a relation? She is not a relation, Lord. Foolish man. One who is not a relation does not know what is suitable or what is unsuitable, or what is right or what is wrong for a woman who is not a relation. Thus you, foolish man, will accept a robe from the hand of a nun who is not a relation? It is not, foolish man, for pleasing those who are not yet, in parentheses, pleased, three dots. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. Whatever monk should accept a robe from the hand of a nun who is not a relation, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture. End quote. And thus this rule of training for monks came to be laid down by the Lord. Then scrupulous monks did not accept exchange of robes with nuns. The nuns, three dots, spread it about saying, quote, How can the masters not accept exchange of robes with us? End quote. Monks heard these nuns, who looked down upon, criticized, spread it about. Then these monks told this matter to the Lord. Then the Lord, on this occasion, in this connection, having given reason to talk, addressed the monks, saying, Monks, I allow you to exchange among these five classes of people, classes of people being in parentheses, a monk, a nun, a female probationer, a male novice, a female novice. I allow you, monks, to accept exchange among these five classes of people. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. Whatever monk should accept a robe from the hand of a nun who is not a relation, except in exchange, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture, end quote. Whatever means, you heard the flashback to Parajika 1 earlier in this episode, so copy-paste, there you go. None means one ordained by both orders, as we know. A robe means any one of the six kinds of robes, including the least one fit for assignment, kinds of and including, we're both in parentheses. Except in exchange means without an exchange. He accepts. In the action there is an offense of wrongdoing. It should be forfeited on acquisition. It should be forfeited to the order, or to a group, or to an individual. And thus monks should it be forfeited, quote within quotes, Honored sirs, this robe accepted from the hand of a nun who is not a relation is to be forfeited 
by me. I forfeit it to the order. End quote within quotes three dots. Open quote within quotes three dots. The order should give back three dots. Let the ro venerable ones give back three dots. I will give back this robe to the venerable one. End quote. Next time that comes up, we'll do a flashback of the first time when it didn't have dots so we can kind of be a little clear on what's going on there in the next episode, perhaps, assuming it's about robes. If he thinks that a woman is not a relation when she is not a relation and, and being in parentheses, accepts a robe, except in exchange, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture. If he is in doubt as to whether the woman is not a relation and accepts a robe, except in exchange, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture. If he thinks that a woman is a relation when she is not a relation and accepts the robe, except in exchange, there is an offense of expiation involving forfeiture. If he accepts a robe, except in exchange from the hand of a woman ordained by one order only, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that a woman is not a relation when she is a relation, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he is in doubt as to whether a woman is a relation, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that a woman is a relation when she is a relation, there is no offense. There is no offense if she is a relation. If there is an exchange, if there is a large thing for a small thing or a small thing for a large thing. If a monk takes it on trust, if he takes it for the long, if he takes it for the time being, if he takes another requisite except the robe, if she is a female probationer, a female novice, if he is mad, if he is the first wrongdoer. Well, there you have it. Special thanks to all of our guests, the cast of today's reading, if you will. Of course, the venerable Udayan and his former wife, played by this rabbit. The nun Upalavana, the robber chief, played by this D&D &D mini. The sad monk who lost his robe when it had to be forfeited. And of course, the Lord Buddha, played by the Lord Buddha, sold as a version of Akshobhya, but you can tell by what he's holding in his left hand that he is in fact Lord Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. Special thanks to the people outside arguing amongst themselves and uh, all the noisemakers forcing us to challenge our ability to meditate in disturbed circumstances. And special thanks to you for going on this ride with me. Today was a bit more fun than I was expecting it to be. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I will now close with the solemn prayer taught to me by my father in the midst of the hollering Punjabis of Sandagar. To the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us and to the spirits below, we send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace. Oh. Until next time.